Morning, uh, colleagues. Uh, thank you for, for making the time to attend this live webinar. Uh, I'm pleased to see that quite a few of you have responded. Uh, very quickly, some background. This is a webinar in a series of webinars that is attached to the program that's the one funded by the EU Commission, uh, which is the professionalization of undergraduate academic teaching in multiple disciplines to address SDGs, uh, PUAT uh, for short. I'm Bala Pillay, I'm the coordinator of the program at UKZN and also the coordinator for the South African partners, which includes Rhodes University, uh, Benda, and, and uh, UKZN, as well as Altasa. Uh, and our partner institutions are Frederick University, which is the, the coordinating university overall, uh, University uh, of uh, Crete. And, and uh, today we have, uh, it's, it's a great honor to introduce two of my colleagues who were part of the project at UKZN. Uh, very briefly, the, the project at UKZN was supported by all the deans of teaching and learning uh, at UKZN together with their colleagues. Uh, and today we are really pleased to announce that Professor Naven Chetty and Dr. Bobby Vargis will be presenting this webinar, uh, the infusion of SDGs in science and engineering. Those of you who have been following our webinars for this program would have realized the opportunity that there is in infusing SDGs in the curriculum of, of higher education universities. And I think it's very, very important uh, because in fact, the importance of infusing SDGs really addresses many of the problems that we face both in society, in the economy, uh, and really in the environment. And I think really the list goes on. Uh, for me, it's a no brainer. I think if we do not take the infusion of SDG seriously, I think we will be denying our students a, a wonderful opportunity of becoming more holistic in their outcomes and in their approach to applying their knowledge in society and in the greater world. Prof. Naven Chetty, uh, he holds a PhD in experimental and computational molecular optics from the University of KwaZulu-Natal. Currently is the Dean of Teaching and Learning in the College of Agriculture, Engineering and Science. That's one of our four colleges at UKZN. Is responsible for practical pedagogical approach in the college. His research interest lies in optics, specifically biomedical and atmospheric optics. Okay, uh, is published uh, extensively. He supervised students uh, up to the level of PhD uh, and is very productive. And currently he's got a big cohort of students that he's supervising. Dr. Bobby Vargis, is currently the head of the Center of Academic Success in Science and Engineering at UKZN. It's a very important center where we focus on academic success of students. Uh, and we also focus on the extended program uh, in this college. He runs the Science and Engineering Access programs as well as academic monitoring and support programs in the college. His area of research includes the conservation of orthodox and recalcitrant plant germplasm. His research looks at mechanisms in desiccation, sensitivity tolerance in plant tissues. He's involved in various academic development initiatives, including the PUR project on the infusion of SDGs in undergraduate curriculum. So I would like to, to welcome both colleagues. The webinar will begin with uh, Professor Naven Chetty, 
And I now hand over to Professor Cherry. Uh, good morning, Prof, and thank you, colleagues, for joining us for this webinar this morning. It's the uh, swan song of the Poat project, I think, as we bring the project to a closure. Um, it would be remiss not to mention the extensive efforts of Prof Pillay that has gone into making this project a success, uh, and also the participation of many of the, um, the, the, the staff within the colleges who've worked uh, extremely hard to get the deliverables done and to make sure that we can meet the aims and objectives of this project. So I'm very grateful for all the support. Uh, it's a pleasure to present this morning to you. Um, I'm going to turn my video off just so that we can maintain some bandwidth conservation. So the title of our presentation this morning is the infusion of the Sustainable Development Goals, or SDGs as they're known, in science and engineering here at UKZN. Just some background information, UKZN, though. Um, in terms of UKZN, we're a multi-campus uh, structure separated by about 86 kilometers. We have a campus in, we have campuses, uh, we have five campuses. I'm having some technical issues here. Give me a second, please. We've got five campuses, and our they're made up of Edgewood. Our medical school in uh, Edgewood is in Pentown. Our medical school is in Durban. Our Marisburg campus, uh, and then we have the Howard British campus also in Durban. And in the heart and the administrative centre of our university is the uh, Westville campus. So, bring, together with the five campuses, we have four colleges operate as uh, you know single entities within this whole structure. We have the College of Agriculture, Engineering and Science, and I'll come back and spend some time on this in a, in a short while. We have the College of Health Sciences, which has uh, four schools and is based on four campuses. We have the College of Humanities, which is uh, based in six schools, and again operates on four campuses. And then we have the College of Law and Management Studies, which, which has four schools and, and operates on three campuses. Uh, the College of Agriculture, Engineering and Science operates on Peter Maritzburg, Westville and Howard College campuses. And we have five schools. Uh, we have the School of Agriculture, Earth and Environmental Sciences. We have the School of Chemistry and Physics. We have the School of Engineering, the School of Life Sciences, and then our uh, smallest school is the School of Mathematics, Statistics and Computer Science. So let's look at the South African picture. We have a, a, a dire problem in South Africa with the number of students that are entering into the sciences on a decline. Although uh, higher education in general is experiencing a massification in terms of enrollments within higher education, the sciences are suffering from the opposite, where the number of students qualifying to enter pure, pure sciences and engineering is decreasing significantly over the number of years. If you look at the NSC statistics in, in that's the metric exam or the school leaving certificate, in 2017, we had nine, uh, 970,000 students enrolled in grade eight. But by the time they exited the system and, and wrote the metric in 2021, we had 750,000 students only wrote the, the metric. This is a drop of about 220,000 students. And, and some may argue that it's attributed to COVID-19 may have had an impact on it, but there's a significant number of students that are dropping out before they even get to metric. So between grade eight and metric, we are seeing a high attrition rate that impacts on number of students that finally emerge into, into the university realm. If we're looking at entry requirements and almost standard across the board is the mathematics entry requirement that every university needs you to do mathematics to enter into science and engineering. And we look at this number that says that in 2021, you only had 33% of students doing mathematics. That's 250 odd thousand. Of those only 13%, about 34,000 passed with greater than 60%. The overall maths pass rate was 57.5%. Only 13% of those students had a mark greater than 60%. 60% would have allowed them, to, uh, would still not have allowed them to enter engineering. Into engineering. engineering needs a 65% uh, minimum in mathematics. But worse still is if you're looking at the physics, that physics would be 198,000, which is 25% of the students did pure physics, which would be the physics and chemistry combined. Um, 15% of those had passes that were greater than 60%. Although the overall pass rate was 69%, the actual uh, pass rate for students with 60% or more was 15%. This is taken as a minimum of entry into our mainstream at UKZN. And, and 
we would see that very few students would meet the entry requirement. Looking at the requirements for a bachelor's pass, we can see that the situation is quite dire because many students can get a bachelor's pass but don't meet entry into the university. What the bachelor's pass is requiring that the student must get 40%, which is not even a pass mark, but 40% in a home language. They need to get 50% and above for any four high credit subjects, that's your maths, your physics, et cetera. And then they need 50% and higher in any two other subjects. So a student who meets these minimum requirements of 40% in, 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 in the home language, of four subjects with 50% or higher, and two subjects with, with um, percentages of 50% and higher will qualify, including in this is, is the included in this is your um, life life orientation program. So the student can get a bachelor's pass, but not actually make entry into university. That that tells us quite a lot. Why is this so? Most of the high school leavers cannot access tertiary because of their poor performance. I've shown you this. So although they can get a bachelor's pass through this here, unable to enter into universities because the requirements are much higher. May, many, many times we're reducing the pass mark. So we're giving them less than 50% to pass the module, but actually they don't look at the problems, the inherent systemic issues within the system. We may have more students passing matric, but we don't have enough students passing matric with the grades required to enter into university. Also, we have more students with bachelor passes and it looks good on paper, but the actual number of students that qualify for higher education is diminished. Or the, the, and the, uh, the quality of the students entering into the system is also into question based on the curving of marks that occurs. What is important to note is that more than 50% of students drop out before getting to matric. This is an incredibly high number and, and it warrants us interrogating it a bit more as, as a country. Otherwise, we're going to have a serious problem in higher education as we move forward. And then COVID hit us. And we had divides that you saw previously where the number of students entering into the university structures were reduced in science and engineering. But now you had COVID-19, which shows that the, the divides that were there increased even further because students who had the infrastructure had the support, did reasonably well, whereas the students who did not have the infrastructure, did not have the support, uh, were not familiar with digital tools, et cetera, the divide increased significantly. Students who, who were not familiar with digital tools, who did not have digital tools, accessing digital tools and resources, who had no space to study and had no support from the schools, just found themselves in a, in, a, in a position that got worse as time went along with the COVID-19 pandemic. And that could have significantly contributed to the number of students that dropped out in the 2021 numbers. However, it's just pointing to the fact that the divides increase. The, uh, when there's a pandemic or when there's a problem, students who do not have become worse off than those who do have. It's, it's a normal uh, uh, situation in, in life, but however, it's, it's been seen to have worsened during the COVID-19 pandemic. So uh, Professor Ravinder Sindhu from the University of Queensland in Australia said, summed it up nicely when she said, the pandemic has revealed the need for more sustainable, ethical, and socially just modes of global higher education. This directly linked to the aims and objectives of the PUAT project. It, it ties in with what the sustainable development goals were saying all along about trying to reduce the divide between the haves and the have-nots. When we look at it, there's something we need to start looking at very carefully within higher education spaces. What is the landscape within our higher education spaces? And it's basically our curriculum reform. We were lucky in that some of our curriculum reform was spurred on by the 2016 uh, fees must fall campaign where we had to look at uh, higher education and start looking at content versus skills. So we started that, and we started to move. However, we must, we must understand that this is not a, a, a once off. This is an ongoing matter where curriculum really needs to be looked at to ensure that our content and our skills are moving into it. But when you look at massification, and I said this, this may be an, this is a, a huge issue in higher education in that there's a massification of uh, an increased number of students entering into higher education. However, that is not necessarily the case in the uh, sciences and in engineering. So staffing in higher education is also uh, impacting on, on our outcomes. We have a lot of staff that are at the junior level, you know, early career academics uh, across the country. Therefore, the experience and the experiences of the students 
will be strong drivers in what the content and skills they obtain from the modules they are enrolled into. Uh, where you have more experienced and higher qualified individuals, it is noticeably that the, the, the content and skills will be much more aligned uh, to, to what the objectives of the module would be. Whereas when you have le less experienced and lower qualified staff, that's going to impact on your higher education outcomes as well. And then the student experience is that not all graduate attributes are the same. You can be in the same college and you can study the same module, but uh, you can study the uh, science, but across you do different modules, the graduates that emerge may not have the same attributes. Some may be far more ready for the workplace, whereas others may not be that. And then the idea is that in our curriculum reform, we should be looking at how to uh, reduce this disparity between uh, graduate attributes. So SDGs work on the principle of people, planet, disparity, peace, and partnerships. So whenever we look at sustainable development, the United Nations based the SDGs on these five principles. And when we talk about it today, you'll see as we move further along how we embed these principles into the uh, curriculum. So I'm not going to run into all of these uh, 17 SDGs, but to say that as a higher education institution, we are well placed to look at all of these SDGs and embed them because we produce graduates who are working in areas that are directly linked or indirectly contribute to the areas that are highlighted within the SDG. So although we talk about quality education as, as goal number four, we, we work very much in the areas of climate action. We work in areas of uh, partnerships, we, we look at sustainable cities and communities. We look at industry, innovation, and infrastructure. So in all of the uh, SDGs that are, are presented here today, as what uh, UN classified as the 17 uh, sustainable development goals, we as an institution are very well placed to contribute to this. And our most valuable contribution to these uh, goals is our human resource development. That is our students, our human capital development. So my idea is that we should be looking at our four E's in terms of curriculum reform to ensure that our curriculum reform is engaging. So how are we gonna draw in the students? What are we going to do to make them uh, have a liking for the subject or to take a, an interest in it? Is it effective? That means, is the per module meeting the purpose that we wanted it to? Will it help the student in their long-term career goals? Will it help them be better prepared for the working world, and will it enhance graduate attributes? But more so, is it enriching for them? So I use an example of physics here. The students don't love physics. I'm a physicist. I know for a fact that the students don't love it. So what is it, what is it in it for them? Why will it benefit them? And what do we need to do to bring them into the classroom in order for them to engage with the subject so that they take away those graduate attributes that make them uh, valuable commodities in the working world, that they are able to become uh, a, a proponents of research, uh, change, as well as driving economic growth. We also need to look at execution. Are we going to deliver it in a manner that makes it interesting and makes it valuable for the student to come to my lecture? You often encounter the story where students say, I don't need to go to lectures because the academic reads from the textbook or I can just read the PowerPoint because that's all the academic does. So at the end of the day, I'm doing this now today. I'm, I'm reading from a PowerPoint to you. Do I make it something that you want to be engaged with? And I think we need to make sure that our approach is such that we, we engage with the student, we make it effective, we enrich it through our execution. The way we deliver our modules is going to be paramount in whether we meet the objectives or not. When we look at our uh, sustainable development goals, we look at the uh, countries that have been producing data on the 17 uh, goals. You'll notice that in some areas we do relatively well, where there's a lot of data available and we can monitor it quite well. And in other areas, we're not uh, able to um, uh, pay the same amount of attention. So if you look at uh, goal number three, we, we seem to be doing relatively well with more than 80% of the countries uh, able to uh, engage with it and provide data. If you look at goal number 
seven. Again, almost 90% of the countries can engage with it and provide data that uh, that is valuable and can be used. But if you look at goal number four, which is your education, you look at it's just under 50% of countries can actually uh, provide data about how they've effectively implemented uh, sustainable journalism goal number four, which is quality education. So ideally, the SDGs are more, the, uh, for us in higher education, it's more than just goal, goal four, as I said, we in higher education are uniquely positioned to address the SDGs either directly or indirectly. And then, as I mentioned previously, human capital development is the most important part of what we're trying to do here and providing a sustainable future where we produce human capital to help drive the SDG goals below, uh, beyond the time frame allocated to see them, which is 2030. So the COVID-19 pandemic has really helped, you know, in, in many senses, it was devastating. The impact on the economy, the impact on, on human life has been devastating. However, it has also helped us to build previously unthinkable relationships. The fact that we can sit here on Zoom today and present this uh, webinar, live stream it throughout the world is an indication of how far we've come. How the fact that technology and, 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 and computational technology, in fact, is helping us uh, to decrease the distances that we can harness skills on. We are closer than ever to achieving goals that we, we set out with the, uh, the, the SDGs, when the UN set out the SDGs and the, the thinking behind it, we are closer than ever to establishing those goals. The problem remains the fact that funding is our greatest challenge. We are always impeded by funding. And when you look at this, I mentioned previously that it was a case of the haves and the have-nots and the divide between them increased significantly. And students that were in the lower income areas were really set back and, and experienced COVID-19 to the, to the detriment uh, of everyone else. So notice that this slide shows you that when you look at uh, the mental health and support, low income countries spent almost no additional measures to account and assist students for mental health issues in the low income, low to middle income, even the upper middle income, bring, there was very little mental health uh, uh, support. Whereas if you look at uh, water sanitation and hygiene, a lot of money went into looking at making sure we were able to uh, uh, provide the sanitizer, provide the uh, clean water, et cetera. We've neglected the mental health and, and psychosocial support of the students, which is going to come back to influence how they perform when they move into uh, higher education or even getting through their matric. You know, the matrics are writing currently and you'll see that the impact of COVID-19 has left many of them shell-shocked and performances are going to be seriously impacted if the students have not had that uh, psychosocial support. If you look at South Africa, we paint an even uh, bleaker picture. In South Africa, we're spending 38% of our money on healthcare, but only 7% on education. So the goal of quality education in South Africa is allocated 7% of the total uh, money allocated to the SDGs. Whereas something like infrastructure development is allocated 38%. Uh, and, and, and your healthcare, which is very important, is allocated 38%. But your education is viewed, uh, viewed as a stepchild of this entire uh, budget allocation and with a meager 7% allocated to that. It's no wonder that our quality in, in, in both primary, uh, secondary, and in fact, the tertiary education is decreasing when the budgets are so low in such an, area, such an important area. And as I said, human capital development through education is the only way for the country to prosper, but we're only throwing in 7% towards that um, ideal and ideology. A little bit about the PIRT project. The PIRT project aims were, were very, very simply to build capacity at academic, uh, in academic staff at undergraduate level um, to help address the SDGs with technological goals and pedagogical ideas into the curriculum. Uh, the idea was to establish a center of excellence for innovation, teaching and learning and curriculum design at our university. It was to produce a center for the accreditation and certification of university teachings. Uh, we, we didn't really make much inroads into this particular goal, 
we have because at the university we already have measures for staff development etc so we didn't uh, make many inroads into that we do have a center of excellence that's going to be opened in a, in a short while the equipment has arrived so we, we've made good progress as UKZN in that particular area uh, we've significantly uh, engaged with with D which is the online community of practice you know our, our colleagues have uh, visited Cyprus and Greece during this uh, project and and our colleagues from Cyprus and Greece have visited us here in South Africa we've also created interlinked networks between universities in South Africa through the University of Venda and the and, and Rhodes University and then finally more broader engagement with Health Hassa. so we've made significant inroads into that particular all of the project and then finally it was to establish the necessary infrastructure and resources to monitor and, and, and assess this in the long term. And so, yes, we've made progress in, in getting the infrastructure with the um, necessary equipment for a center of excellence. And then we have re resources in which to continue monitoring. And this resources is not just monetary. It's also we've had same staff that are now able to monitor, assess and sustain these uh, PIOT goals in the long term. So beyond the lifespan of the project itself. The PIOT uh, project was based on a uh, principles as part of the uh, performance competence and indicators performance framework we, we're looking at 21st century critical skills we looked at 21st century learning goals and then finally sustainability justice uh, i think all of these an e equally important uh, uh, part of the project um, and, and is necessary for us to see that we're helping embed into the sdgs so when you look at um the 21st century learning goals, we, we're basically looking at how we're learning to know, we're learning to be, we're learning to live together sustainably, we're learning to do, we're learning to give and share, and finally, how do we learn to transform oneself and society? So I mentioned these because when Dr. Varghese takes over, he will uh, indicate some of these in, in the modules that we looked at at UKZN and how this has been implemented, implemented into the curriculum. When you look at the, and the critical skills, we look at the 10 C's, and those include communication, uh, critical thinking, connectivity, trust cultural competence, uh, and you know, critical consciousness. I'm not going to go through all of them, but these 10 C's are incredibly important in ensuring that our curriculum talks to what we want to achieve, which is our employable graduates that make meaningful contributions to the country, and in particular to the SDGs. When you look at social justice perspective, we looked at all of these justices, environmental justice, economic justice, cross-cultural justice, and social justice from the social justice perspective. So the three pillars, as I mentioned, were critical skills, thinking skills, and the justice perspective. So we've included that in the in the idea of the PIOT project. And when we look at the outcomes, we in looking at the outcomes on the basis of these uh, three three main areas. Dr. Bargis, I'm going to hand over to you. Thank you, Prof. Chetty. Good morning, everyone who has made time today morning to be online to participate in this webinar. Um, if you hear some issues with sound, don't think it's network problem. I have got a, thro a crocky throat and my apologies in advance for that. So as Professor Chetty has already mentioned that the sustainable development goals of United Nations were cast on stone in 2015 and we pro progressing towards 2030 to see how many goals uh, each of the countries would achieve. And these goals were set in so that it would have a huge impact on, on the countries across the world, especially the developing countries. So let me share my presentation with this. There is a Chichewa Malawian proverb that says, Mera Mpoyamba which literally can be translated as catch them while young. Teach a child in the path they have to go and they will not turn from it even when they are old. These are proverbs that we hear and it is so pertinent in the day to day. Higher education institutions like ours, UKZN has a huge role to play. 
The Council of Higher Education in South Africa has pointed out that the South African aspirations for SDGs are vested in the work and roles of academic staff who are involved in educating young minds. Yes, uh, we do not get children at UKZN, but young adults with huge prospects and career in front of them. And for SDGs to become a part of all the developments, the key is to have education for sustainable development. ESD or education for sustainable development has been defined as the type of education that allows every human being to acquire the knowledge, skills, attitudes, and values, which is necessary to shape a sustainable future for the generations to come. We can then agree that uh, there is a need of curriculum based on student center approach because we educating the future generation. And this must focus on improving academic and higher order thinking skills and teaching and learning strategies for sustainable development. There is also a need to reorient the existing higher education program with a focus towards sustainability and infusion of the 17 SDGs in one way or the other in multiple academic disciplines, which was the main aim of this project. So knowing this to be very important and key in our development, at the start of the PUAR project, we wanted to know how much students in our college in UKZN know about the various SDGs and their alignment with the South African higher education. We also wanted to know what are the students' perceptions about integrating SDGs in the current programs. And we looked at if they believe, if the students believe that this would improve their chance of employability. Our engagement with the students was also to know which are the most important SDGs for South Africa, according to them, what they believe. And do they think infusing SDGs into the study program can increase their competitiveness in the labor market? So with a host of questions, we went about this uh, investigation. This was a survey and focus group discussion. The project had ethical clearance and had a very extended survey. I am presenting only a few of the results to you because of the time constraints. So if we look at this graph for a change, in our university, there were more males who took this survey. 46% uh, of the participants were females. Most of the students who took the survey <clears throat> were first years and third year students. And also we saw that a substantial number of uh, postgraduate students also took part in the survey. Students, this slide shows that they believe that the current study programs in uh, our college, College of AES, helps them to work individually, helps them to construct new knowledge, make logical judgments, and share their thoughts effectively. However, they rarely learn to perceive oppression and take necessary action against it, or write reflections on their own assignments or develop a study portfolio or, or a portfolio of their study progress. So uh, this was area of concern and that is denoted by more red color in the bars. Student understanding of 17 SDGs, 12 to 38% of the students who took the survey had a good knowledge and a very good knowledge about the 17 SDG, understanding of 17 SDGs, but 44% of the students had limited knowledge, while 6% of the students had no knowledge at all about the 17 SDGs. So we also asked them where did they get the knowledge about the SDGs of United Nations and majority of the students gained their knowledge about SDGs from TV or social media and knowing the Gen Z generation, this is not uh, very surprising, but many other students, uh, about 30% of them, they also said that they got the information from university courses, which is very promising to see. So we asked them that, what do they believe are the most important SDGs for the African continent? 
and responses from students in the college showed that AES students believe that most important SDG for the African continent is ending poverty, then quality education, followed by good health, uh, gender equality, and clean water and sanitation. Uh, unfortunately, it appears that the students see climate change to be of low priority than these SDGs, but very possibly these are the key ones that they feel should be the ones to focus on. Many students also believe that SDGs, such as ensuring healthy lives, inclusive education and gender equality, have been discussed well in their courses that they study, uh, irrespective of the qualifications across the college. But SDGs such as ending poverty or building, that's SDG 1, or building resilient infrastructure, you can see SDG 11, and making cities safe and sustainable, these are not discussed significantly in the university courses. It could also be that the students uh, who took this survey, uh, very few of them could have been from engineering. So as per the PUAD guidelines, the next step was to try and infuse SDGs into the existing curriculum for various uh, courses in the College of AES. Uh, it is common sense that though not explicitly shown, most of the SDGs are already embedded in most modules in our college. However, this attempt was to showcase the SDGs, make the relevance and connections of the SDGs for the students, and then develop student-centered learning material, which comprises of the 10 competency skills, which uh, Prof. Chetty mentioned a few minutes ago, uh, to look at digital literacy, to, uh, to also involve transform pedagogies and with sustainability at the core of all of this. So we also used a KWHL chart. This should be used before, during, and after a student reads about a new topic. Filling out this chart prepares a student for reading about a topic, helps in reviewing what has been learned about the material, and gives help in obtaining more information. And it also readies the student to write what they have learned when assessed. So K in the KWHL chart stands for the student to have a self-assessment of what you already know about the subject. W stands for what you want to learn. H stands for figuring out how you can learn more about the topic and L stands for what you learn as you read. So I'm just showcasing one example of a learning activity. So remember, these activities were executed across all the four colleges, the College of Law and Management, Health Sciences, and Humanities as well. So few modules and few topics were chosen from each of the college and to a tune of 40 to 50 modules across the universities were investigated. So I'm just showcasing one example of a learning activity that was developed for a module in our college. The topic that was chosen is bacterial water contamination, causes and effects. So as advised, uh, as per the PUAD guidelines, multiple learning strategies were used to address this topic, right from explaining the relevance of SDG 6, which is clean water and sanitation in a national African and international context. The other SDGs under which this topic could be studied were SDG 2, so no hunger, which means need for clean water to cook food and consume. SDG 3, good health and well-being, contaminated water and human diseases, the relation between that. SDG 11, sustainable cities and communities. And even SDG 14, which is life underwater, the effect of contaminated water on aquatic life. So these were involved in the teaching material. So various learning styles, as you would see from this slide, included watching a few well-informed YouTube videos and answering questions from those videos, analyzing water quality data from the provided data, news articles, chapter from a book, water access in South Africa, very pertinent to the local 
issues, isolating pathogens from water drawn from various sources, and then seminar on the topic, a site visit to a water treatment plan, plant, a trip to a rural area for community engagement, and finally culminating in creating an infographic on water contamination management strategy. So you can clearly see that various practices, pedagogical practices were used here and teaching and learning styles were used here on a single topic for a student to have a comprehensive understanding on the topic. Each of these activities that were developed across our college and across other colleges in the university, they were sent for peer review and finally checked by an international expert. So reviewing of the Puat learning activities for various modules were done using templates that were developed by our European partners, Prof. Makrakis from the Frederick University and Prof. Nelly from the University of Crete. So the first peer review was to evaluate which of the 17 SDGs, direct and others indirect, are uh, integrated or infused in the developed student learning activity. So that was our first task for review. And the second peer review was to evaluate the key indicators in terms of the educator or the academic, which are 10 indicators they had mentioned. And for the learner who is learning the topic, there were 20 indicators. I don't have time to go through all of them, but Evaluating whether student-driven learning activity professionalizes academic instructors to various points, such as embed embedding of SDGs in their courses, opportunity for personal and professional development, interdisciplinary learning in academic teaching, and possibility of multidisciplinary collaboration, possibility of connecting academic teaching to wider community. So we looked at a host of uh, different points of when such an activity is developed by an academic who is teaching, how does it help them in personal development and also keeping SDG in mind. This slide shows the peer review of evaluating the effect of the student-centered learning activities in modules on students or the learners. So there were 20 indicators. Again, I'm not going to mention all of them, but the key ones are allowing students to delve deeply into real issues around specific SDGs. Exercising SDGs, cross-cutting skills and competencies, the 10 Cs, are they included in this development? To see the applicability of SDGs to their lives and future careers, to engage students to play an active role in construction of knowledge, are they themselves able to create new knowledge? And engaging students in raising critical questions on real life issues affecting them and their future. So there were 20 points, but I'm, I've only included eight here on this slide. So I don't have to tell you this, but we all know that world-class research in areas of SDGs enables world-class undergraduate education at UKZF. Various ranking agencies, have audited and ranked UKZN in one of the top universities in South Africa, in Africa, and also in the top 400 across the world universities. So world-class research is a key to such a reputation. Postgraduate students and academics involved in research in multiple SDGs, areas of different SDGs in AES, and as would be the case with most leading universities, the academics and researchers in different fields would more or less conduct research in the areas of the 17 SDGs of the United Nations. So undergraduate students in our college, they, by virtue of this, being part of a university teaching department, get a taste of high quality innovation and research. So during undergraduate research, Projects, design projects, workshops, vacation work, and various such activity like having third year research projects in, in the school where I am associated with. 
undergraduate students are trained by nationally and internationally renowned academics. So let me quickly take you on a journey of some good research in our college. This is by no means exhaustive and I have not selected um, uh, these people or research on basis of any priority, but showing you a few SDGs, SDG 1 and SDG 2. For example, the African Center for Food Security in our college, it starts with finding pragmatic solutions for food security issues, how to meet Africa's food demands. We also have the African Center for Crop Improvement, whose mandate is the developing and releasing of new improved varieties of food security crops. This again is to ensure high productivity of crops to alleviate poverty and hunger. Let me move. Next is SDG3. The chair of today's webinar, Prof. Bala Pillay, has spent decades working on alternative therapeutic interventions to combat tuberculosis. Also numerous strategies towards development of new drugs and vaccines to fight the deadly disease of tuberculosis in Africa is ongoing in his lab for years. Great uh, developments in the area of health and well-being. Another well-known scientist in our college, Prof Mwambi, who works on modeling of various diseases such as malaria, HIV, and great work of international reputation. Another world-renowned scientist, Prof Shahidul Islam, who has for the past couple of decades worked on pathogenesis of type 2 diabetes and obesity. So his research is also involved with various anti-diabetic drugs and developing them. SDG for quality education. So when it comes to quality education, all STEM qualifications in our college, I should say, provide uh, quality education, right from data science to astronomy to agriculture to biochemistry to pure mathematics. I can go on and on to the morning. You know, but quality education is the key. That is what we strive to attain through all our offices and through each and every academic and every teaching and learning strategy. However, I'm just showing you a field of cutting edge teaching and learning. You know, sometimes they say, is this rocket science? Yes, this is rocket science. The Aerospace Systems Research Group in the School of Engineering are in the research of developing rockets and space vehicles which they have already launched successfully. Nonetheless, all engineering programs have full accreditation and our graduates enter the working field fully prepared. SDG 5, gender equality. Professor Urumila Bob has mentored many undergraduate and postgraduate students in the field of gender equality. Her research projects emphasize gender issues and current issues affects women in particular. Next is SDG, SDG 6, clean water and sanitation. I cannot not mention late Professor Chris Buckley, who was a pioneer in the field. He established in the 70s, many decades ago, he established what is now known as the Water Sanitation and Hygiene Research and Development Center, WASH. And this center carries on research in various spheres of water testing, wastewater management, innovation, sanitation technology with undergraduate and postgraduate students. SDG 7, affordable and clean energy. Many staff in various schools in our college are working on this SDG, but I cannot name them all for now. So one outstanding achievement for the School of Engineering is the solar car project that won accolades in national and international competitions and platforms. Professor Freddy Inambayo leads the Green Energy Solution Research Group. He has worked for years on various renewable energy sources and green energy solution systems that is mentioned on the slide. Next slide is slide SDG 11, Sustainable Cities and Communities. Professor Christina Troyes, the NRF South African Research Chair in Waste and Climate Change, has for many years worked on many issues to do with sustainable African cities. 
Her smart and symbiocity concepts are well accepted and published. Next is SDG 13, very important, climate action. Again, there are numerous research, research groups that are working on climate change and effect of elevated temperatures and carbon footprint on humans, plants, animals, uh, water, land, and on and on. So I couldn't put everything there. I have uh, put here for you some of my own paper uh, that's for representation on this slide for you. Effect of elevated temperatures, acid rain, and uh, pollution, air pollution, sulfur dioxide pollution in the Durban Basin area on plant growth and development. SDG 14, life underwater. Professor Ursula Scala from School of Life Sciences works on estuaries and she looks at ecosystem health of estuaries, marine animals there. Dr. David Glassam also works on marine animals. His research, he works on corals, his research on microplastics in the oceans, uh, especially in the guts of fishes, uh, has gained great momentum, is widely recognized. I would also like to mention uh, uh, Mr. Gan Moodley, who also works in this field in the School of Life Sciences. SDG 14, uh, I cannot even mention how many scientists in the college and especially in the School of Life Sciences are working on numerous projects in life on land. And you can see the variety of topics right from fungal and bacterial uh, topics to parasitic diseases, to uh, medicinal plants, to uh, elephant conservation projects, uh, cape parrots, vertebrates and other invertebrates, plant biodiversity conservation, and my own research area of cryopreservation of recalcitrant plant germplasm. And finally, SDG 17. So numerous collaborative projects and MOUs with researchers in CAEs and universities worldwide. The PUAR project that is that I, I'm representing now itself is an example of collaboration between South Africa, Cyprus, Greece. Um, and then there's another project in the pipeline by ACME International. Uh, there is collaborations, MOUs with a uh, university in China. Basically, I just put in a graph which shows the 128 MOUs that we have in UKZN between universities across different uh, continents. You can see the most of them is with European partners, uh, but I, I'm sure that many of this is actually from our college. So though this project did not involve postgraduate teaching and learning and research, but what I'm implying is that the PG research has an integrated involvement in the undergraduate teaching and learning. And various SDGs invariably become part of our teaching and learning at the undergraduate program. So let me bring you to conclusion of this webinar. It's very difficult to conclude uh, a whole project uh, that involve various partners with just one slide, but that's what I'm going to do. Sustainable development goals are embedded in both undergraduate and postgraduate curricula in the College of AES. Developed student activities help to understand the process of infusing SDGs in various modules to enhance teaching and learning. The need of intentionally extending this infusion to various modules in the college there is need for training academic staff in the colleges to align curriculum and teaching and learning to SDGs and United Nations. Factors, especially decolonized curriculum, Africanization, essay higher education landscape and various critical factors must be taken into consideration while modifying curricula to infuse SDGs. Infusion of SDGs in curricula results in graduates that are workplace ready in a global society evidenced by high ranking of UKZN in general and CAES, our college in particular. So with this, I would like to really thank the European Commission, the Erasmus Project for Capacity Building Higher Education Program. I would like to thank the University of KwaZulu-Natal to allow this project to be run 
in our university, the College of Agriculture, Engineering and Science staff uh, who were involved in this project or who helped with the project. Professor Bala Pille, the South African local coordinator who is based in UKZN, Professor Vasilos Makrakis from Frederick University and the University of Crete in Greece, our European partners as well. And last but not the least, uh, Mrs. Devashni Chinaya for administrative support. This way our, uh, the project leader was Frederick University uh, in Cyprus and these were our local partners uh, in the project. Thank you to each one of them. Uh, this is the core team that was involved. Uh, and this was the project winding meeting in Athens in Greece. And in the background, you can see the temple of Parthenon from 500 BC, uh, some 2,500 years ago. It was a great experience for me to be part of such a wonderful team, to learn from Prof. Pillay, and all the deans of teaching and learning, uh, and uh, Prof. Chetty, Dr. Anna Bengzai from Law and Management, and Dr. Dahlia Vergis are not represented in this picture, but great thanks to them also. And thank you to each one of you for a patient listening and to make time to be part of this uh, webinar today. Thank you. I pause. Thank you, Chair. Thank you, uh, Bobby and uh, Naveen. Uh, I must say that uh, even though I'm from UKZN, I was very, very impressed uh, with the amount of effort that you put in, both of you, and also in really espousing the, the, you know, the, the goals of the project and how UKZN has made its contribution uh, from the various facets that you, that you presented. So, uh, so, so I must say to you, well done. Uh, it's a highly impressive presentation, presentations. Uh, and thank you very much for the effort that you put in, in, in showcasing uh, what was done at UKZN. Uh, I'm gonna now throw the floor open for questions. There are a few in the chat, but we could start off, if anybody's got questions they would like to, to pose directly, uh, please, Raise your hand, and I think uh, Sne will will give you will unmute you, and you could then contribute. Anybody like to kick off? Okay. Uh, while we are waiting, uh, let's go to. Uh, there was uh, Vasilis. Uh, Vasilis, would you want to present your question, or would you want to read it from the? The are you there? Can we unmute the Silas of Krakus? I don't, I don't hear anything. I, I will uh, read out the Silas question for the first presentation. Uh, Naveen Chetty, how do you explain that only seven percent? of the SDGs share goes to SDG quality education, taking into consideration that education should be the driver for achieving all other SDGs. Uh, that's from Vasilis Makrakis. Uh, Naveen, are you there? Uh, yes, Prof. I, I responded in the chat to say, I'm flummoxed as well. When I saw the numbers, I was flummoxed by the fact that we only spend education at uh, 7%. I, I, I actually couldn't uh, give an explanation why they do that. I think the priorities went to healthcare and it went to infrastructure and development. That that seems to be where the money is gone. Uh, there aren't many uh, reports indicating what the, the, whether it was normal sort of in healthcare and infrastructure development or was it related directly to SDGs and the, the goals that were set out. Uh, uh, the report just simply highlighted the amount of money that was spent on, on those particular ones, which are highlighted. Thanks, Chair. Well, uh, when was the data for? Which year, anyway? Uh, 2021. The data was 2021. So maybe the COVID-19 pandemic may have skewed it, but uh, the reports are very sparse in this sort of area where the actual amounts provided for uh, are indicated. This was just provided for um, 
in, in a report that, that showed the, the, the total percentage is not even the actual amounts. Okay, I think, I think we must all be cognizant of the fact that the cake, the size of the cake uh, in, in developing countries, including South Africa, has shrunk uh, due to the effect of the pandemic on the economies. And I think what most governments are doing is basically reallocating the budget for what they see as priority items. Certainly, uh, health would be one of them uh, and, and perhaps other areas. And unfortunately, it's done at the expense of education. Uh, Vasilis, are you satisfied with that? Or can you move on? I'm not hearing Vasilis. Okay. It's choosing to chat. Uh, sorry? He's yeah, choosing I'll, I'll... to chat and not talk. Yeah. yeah. Okay. There we go. Then the other question or comment from uh, Vasilis is TV and other social media uh, overpass university courses in terms of knowledge on SDGs. This is well replicated by many previous studies, including his own. That's Vasilis's own study. This is something that we should be highly concerned for the role played by education as an agent of change. Okay, so it's a comment, uh, uh, Naveen and Bobby, do you, wanna, do you wanna say anything to that? Yes, Prof, yeah. Uh, when we were analyzing the data as well, and yesterday I spoke to Naveen about this, I was also surprised to see that actually the students are so social media driven and they're getting cues and information from, um, from either Googling the topic before they answered this uh, survey, that could be a possibility. But also to see, we are happy to note that uh, around 30% of, uh, of those who took the survey, they said that they did learn it from the various modules or courses in the university, which is promising. But yes, I, I understand what Prof Vasilos is saying that, you know, it's a concern, but that's, that's what the um, new generation is and we have to somehow accept that. Okay, so, so uh, Bobby, uh, the, the slides you presented of the colleagues that were in Athens, uh, I don't know if it was deliberate, but you seem to make us look really extremely overweight. Was any reason for that? <laughs> The, I think the picture was stretched sideways, Prof. No, no, I'm, I'm joking. No. <laughs> unless it's unless an illusion. It's... The, break, the breakfast were free in the hotel, so maybe yes. just in the morning okay. after the breakfast. It's shrunk in the wash. Okay. <laughs> okay, I, I've, I've uh, posted a question. Questions. Uh, I, I just want to get your comments, uh, Bobby and Naveen. Firstly, what, what were the most important challenges in, that you found in implementing? Uh, the SDGs in the curriculum at UKZN. Uh, I'll give you all three one time and you can respond. What lessons did we learn from this project, from our project? And thirdly, how do we sustain the project at UKZN and in South Africa uh, beyond the funding of the EU Commission? So please come in, either of you. So, oh. I'll step in first, I think, maybe with the challenges. I think um, the, the initial stage of the project was the conceptualization. And I think in looking at the project and what was going to be required was, was sort of the stepping stone. But once we got, it, we got started, it was amazing to see how much of work was being done in the, in the background uh, through curriculum reform and through the curriculum itself. In, 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 in the, with the SVGs being part of that curriculum. You know, it, it, it actually was eye-opening as Bobby highlighted some of the research ones, but if you look at undergraduate modules as well, there are multiple modules which talk directly to some of the goals, uh, SDGs, and it this, this allowed us to look at the curriculum, look at the modules and see uh, this pop out. It's, you know, it, it showed that it was coming through. The area that we must focus on is uh, curriculum reform and the alignment of the curriculum reform with graduate attributes, which I think is where we seriously lacking. So although some modules are getting it right, there are more areas where we need to look at our curriculum and we need to change that in line with where we want to be in the 21st century skills and uh, our 21st century uh, um, you know, graduates and what we expect them to do. So we're producing those graduates, I think that's the sustainability pathway. 
produce graduates who are aware of these goals, aware of what they need to be doing, and are aware, have the skills and uh, not just the qualification, but the skills that are going to make them a valuable commodity in the working world to take it forward. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, Bobby, any comments? To those? Yeah, Prof. Just to add, you know, one of the challenges was the coming of COVID suddenly. So when this was written up in 2018 and implemented in 2019, um, th this was a very full forward thinking project because these 10 C's that needs to be um, in, included in the curricula for uh, better employability and graduate attributes as Naveen has mentioned now, uh, was well thought in this project. And uh, suddenly COVID came and we lost almost one and a half years. So that was a major challenge. But the good thing is that our university, they really picked it up from mid-August um, uh, and then we were able to achieve the deliverables that we could. But one of the very important questions, and thank you for this question that you have posed, is about how this project uh, can be taken forward. So as much as we know that uh, the project is coming to an end, but the beauty of the conclusion of this project is that the techniques and the principles that we have learned from this project can be very well implemented uh, in not only in our college, but across various colleges in the university. So uh, the, the, the greatest positive point is that the deans of teaching and learning are part of it, and they have a buy-in to this. It's about educating the academics more and more in the college with these principles and with these techniques so that even if it's not applied completely in a module, uh, definitely major portions of the modules must incorporate these goals and the tendencies uh, and, and the social justice aspect that was presented uh, today morning. So uh, it's, it's important that we continue and not stop this project here. Yes, um, technically and officially and financially, this project may come to a close, but the ethos and the principles that we take from this needs to be continued. In the, in the years ahead. And I, I would believe that a big uh, deal of responsibility goes to the deans of teaching and learning in each of the colleges. Thank you. Thank you very much for that, Bobby. Uh, would anybody else like to say a few words before we close? Uh, this is open to anyone who would like to make a comment. Vasilis, would you like to say something? Uh, I'll ask my colleagues, uh, Joanne, if you are there. You'd like to say something or Tabi? Okay, I don't see any takers. I, I want to firstly thank once again our presenters. It, it was an excellent uh, presentation for each of you. Uh, and I think we all appreciated this. Uh, I must say that we had an audience that did not diminish even beyond the 60 minute uh, time frame of the presentations. I think that was excellent. So thank you all to the audience for, for attending and making the time. And I want to say that, uh, the, you know, amongst the lessons that we learned from this project is that there is a lot happening at all our institutions, both in South Africa and abroad. Uh, and I think until we really started mining and looking deep at what we're doing, uh, we had very little idea of how much we were doing uh, at our institutions uh, in terms of integrating SDGs uh, into the curriculum. So I think this was really a really excellent project. Uh, and I think from, from the presentations today, I would say without any doubt, it's been fairly successful uh, at UKZN and I'm sure at the other institutions as well. So I just wanna thank everybody uh, for their attention. And I think what is important uh, take home message for me is often we start a project, the project expires due to lack of funding and that's the end of the project. And we're busy applying for projects, for, uh, funding for new projects. I think what would be good is if we can try to sustain this project with our partners, both national and international, and, and really keep it going, even if we don't have current EU Commission funding. Maybe we could get funding at a later stage, but I would say let us make the effort to try and really build on what we've achieved so far and to sustain this in the interest of, of our students, 
and in the interest of everybody else. Vasilis, you would like to say something? Yes. Uh, hello, Bala. Sorry for the starting point. I didn't have the opportunity to uh, make my points, you know. Yeah. But I'm uh, very, uh, very glad for the presentations. They are very meaningful. And the points rates are very important. I just want to uh, stress the importance of uh, disseminating uh, what has been achieved, and especially uh, in terms of uh, activities, uh, tools, and uh, we have to find ways how to, uh, uh, I mean, to uh, ensure the long-term sustainability of the project. I know that COVID has uh, created a lot of problems from all of us, but of course now it's time to rethink again and learn from this situation and try uh, to make the project, uh, you know, um, landmark, uh, not only in South Africa, but also in the region and in our uh, partner uh, countries. So thank you very much again for organizing uh, this uh, very important uh, webinar. And uh, I'm looking forward to um, uh, discuss the key points, uh, uh, you know, in our own, uh, you know, final uh, report uh, for the project. Thank you very much uh, again for everything. Yeah, thank you, thank you, Vasilis. Uh, I'll just uh, quickly read uh, uh, Joanne's comment before we close. Joanne says SDGs have been integrated into the curriculum and this project has enabled us to establish the extent of it. We have learned a lot of, about how to infuse SDGs and the importance of appropriate pedagogies that enable students to engage with SDGs and develop an understanding of the importance of contributing to the sustainability of the planet. I think that really is the biggest challenge uh, is sustainability of the planet, given the fact that our population is growing at a very fast rate. Uh, it's demanding more and more resources from the planet. And really sustainability is key. Sustainability is really key when it goes to addressing the needs of such a large world population. And education is certainly one of the big contributors and drivers to deal with this issue. So I, I want to thank all of you for your attention. Uh, and and have, a, have a good day going further. And thank you very much for your attention. And once again to the presenters, an excellent job. Well done. Thank you. Thank you, Prof. Thanks, Prof. Thank you, colleagues, for attending. Have a great day and have a good weekend.